Hey guys, so I did my last video and I was reading a few quotes from Dave Rockefeller's autobiography from 2002 entitled Memoirs and I think they're very telling and you know people often say well how do you know what to trust if you don't trust the news? Well I go right from the horse's mouth and get what they say. Write what they say in their own books, their own white papers, their own writings, their own videos. It's all there. It's all free. It's all available. So it's I'm going to jump right into a few quotes now from this book called The Anglo-American Establishment. The Anglo-American Establishment was written by Professor Carol Quigley, who was a Harvard and Princeton uh, trained historian and a professor at Georgetown. He was Bill Clinton's mentor, so by no means a conspiracy theorist. He wrote several books. The two most interesting for people that share our perspective, but the perspective that I share is factual documented information. Uh, and so the one I'll be quoting is a, a follow-up to this book here, or a preface, depending on the way you look at it, Tragedy and Hope. And I'm taking quotes from the Anglo-American Establishment book that he wrote, and I'm going to just start right now with what it says right on the back there. And uh, it's pretty interesting, right, what it says on this book. And like I said, Carol Quickly is a very, very highly legitimate, highly esteemed historian, author, and professor. So you know, don't take what he's saying here lightly. Uh, this is a quote from the back of the Anglo-American Establishment book. It says, No country that values its safety should allow what the Milner Group... Now, before I continue, the Milner Group is a group of people, including the Rothschild family, Cecil Rhodes, Milner himself. There's a lot of families that come into this, and so people talk about the Illuminati and stuff like that. I don't use that. Yes, there was an actual historic organization called the Illuminati, which existed, in the encyclopedia, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica from 1776 to 1793. And then it was supposedly outlawed, but George Washington has writings entered into the Library of Congress admitting it still existed after that fact up until 1798. But it's also interesting that this group right here, the Milner Group, created the Encyclopedia Britannica. And we'll get into that maybe today, maybe another time, but I want to show you some of these quotes. So that when you're, there's no actual real name for this group. Sometimes they're called the the Rhodes Group, the Round Table Group, the Milner Group, Milner's Kindergarten they're even referred to as. But this is an actual group with actual names and, and people that are involved. It's not like some mysterious group, oh, like Rihanna is in the Illuminati. It's not, it's not like that. This is, this is like a factual, actual stuff. So I try to stay away from that term of the Illuminati and deal with factual things because once you start getting too out there, even if it's talking about factual things, people start to get the glaze on, and they don't listen, and they're like, oh, he's a, he's a conspiracy theorist. So. so this is the back cover of that book. No country that values its safety should allow what the Milner Group accomplished. That is, a small number of men would be able to wield such power in administration and politics, should be given almost complete control over the publication of documents relating to their actions, should be able to exercise such influence over the avenues of information that create public opinion, and should be able to monopolize so completely the writings and the teachings of the history of their own period. So he's saying there's a, a, a elite group of people that completely control and dominate everything about them in the history and all their writings. So uh, goes on to talk here about how these people went on to create the League of Nations and they wanted that to be basically the prototype of the United Nations which is also the prototype of world government if you will. So these people created the United Nations, but here on page 33 in that book, and this is this also relates to the people that are tuning in here in Rhode Island, or at least have been following Gina Raimondo, the governor here. She's a member of the Rhodes Scholar. When you hear someone say, oh, he's a Rhodes Scholar, it sounds like a good thing. It sounds like a really smart person. But people don't know what a Rhodes Scholar is, and well, I'm going to tell you right now because it's right out of the book. Where there's a quote right here. It's page 33 from the Anglo-American Establishment, written by Carol Quigley. Quote, the secret society of Cecil Rhodes is mentioned in the first five of his seven wills, referring to Lord Rothschild. The scholarships were merely, merely a facade. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Actually, he's talking about Cecil Rhodes and Rothschild is mentioned in there and also uh, finances extensively. So pardon my mistake. He's talking. I'm actually I'd have to go look this back up. But let me just read the whole quote here. The secret society of Cecil Rhodes is mentioned in the first five of his seven wills. Scholarships were merely a facade to conceal the secret society, or more accurately, 
they were to be one of the instruments by which the members of the secret society could carry out his purpose. So they're saying here that in all these wills, it was for a creation, not my words, their words, of a secret society. And the scholarships were merely a facade to either conceal the secret society or to further the work of the secret society. And they, the next question that anybody asks is, well, what is the purpose of the secret society? And it says, the purpose, as expressed in the first will, was, quote, the extension of British rule throughout the world and the ultimate recovery of the United States of America. So they are referring to, part of that mix-up, they are referring to Cecil Rhodes' will, but he's working hand-in-hand -hand with Rothschild uh, in all of this. So the, the, Cecil Rhodes, people talking about Rhodes scholarships and, and being a Rhodes scholar, like that's a good thing. It's merely a facade for a secret society of Anglo-American establishment trying to unite the world, one world. I read you the quotes earlier. I'm reading the quotes now. Uh, a racist elit elitist group. And, uh, in the, and it goes on to say on page 34, in the third will, the sole trustee was Lord Rothschild. And so, it's, it's okay, so this is a very telling quote. And I won't be able to even get to all these quotes here from the book, but uh, very interesting quote here. This is on page 35, and um, this is, I'll just start the quote here. In 1894, Steed discussed with Rhodes how the secret society would work, and wrote about it after Rhodes' death as follows. We also discussed various projects for propaganda, the formation of libraries, the acquisition of newspaper, which was to be devoted to the service of the cause. So, I will maybe continue with maybe one more quote after this, but I think this is the most important thing. So, this is 1894, right? So, they're talking about, we're going to gather various types of propaganda, formation of libraries, and a newspaper. And I already mentioned that the Encyclopedia Britannica was created by these people. Not to mention the Times and the other establishment newspaper at the time in England, which is escaping my mind. They also had their people as, like, editors there. And then, uh, at Oxford, uh, All Souls, Balliol, all these places, they had their people as deans or presidents of the school. So, if you went to school, you were consuming information by the secret society. If you went to a library, you were consuming information. If you got it from a newspaper, if you got it from the Encyclopedia Britannica, you were consuming information by this group. And then, even if you read fiction, Ryard Kipling wrote the Jungle Book and all those other stories, is also a member of this elite secret society. It's all facts. It's all on record. And I'm only reading you a few of these quotes, but I'm going to sum up the rest of this video with an interesting point, because people act like they have their own ideas, their own thoughts. If anybody hasn't seen this video on YouTube, it's like a two-minute video, one-minute video, type it into YouTube right after you're done with this. It's called David Icke Repeaters. I don't agree with everything that David Icke says, but he's got a two-minute video talking about repeaters. And basically what he says, I'm going to boil it down right, right now and rip it off, is people don't think for themselves. They just repeat what they were taught in school, repeat what they hear in the newspaper, repeat what they hear on the TV. But as I'm showing you right here, as far back as the 1890s and well before that, I can even go a little bit further, they controlled every single piece of information, every sing, almost every single way you get information from this time. Now, this is not my opinion. This is the opinion of David Rockefeller himself. This is the opinion of Carol Quigley, Cecil Rhodes, Lord Rothschild, Milner, Steed, all these dudes. So, it's not just 1894. So, quickly, before I end this video, I'm going to take you guys how everything, almost everything, I won't say everything, but almost everything we've ever ingested as terms of information has been controlled by a rich, elitist, racist, secret society till this very day. And I'm going to lay it out here in less than a minute. So, boom. As I just showed you right here, turn of the century... They controlled the newspapers, they controlled the, uh, they controlled the schools, they controlled fiction, non-fiction, encyclopedias, so forth. So then you skip over to America, and then you've got radio. Edward Bernays is, was controlling pe think people from behind the scenes with radio. And then even before that, it's entered into the congressional record that J.P. Morgan asked, 
how many or what percentage of American newspapers he would have to purchase to control what Americans thought daily, and the answer was 21 to 35 percent, and then he proceeded to do so. J.P. Morgan was an American partner of this group. Then after that, you get TV, and you got the three channels, ABC, and then you got CBS, which I talked about, and I read the quote earlier about William Paley being head of the Psychological Warfare Department. And then I was at Rockefeller Center the other day where you have General Electric and NBC, and their ties to the Nazis and David Rockefeller and every quote that I read earlier. Then you fast forward to the 1960s, there's something that's declassified called Operation Mockingbird, where the CIA spent over a billion dollars worth of today's money to buy journalists in print and in video to control what they say. Then you fast forward a little bit more and you think, oh, well, now we're in the 90s and the 2000s and the 2010s and we have all these channels, thousands of channels, and we got the internet, right? Well, everything we watch on TV or here on the radio is owned by five or six corporations. It fluctuates, you know? And almost every single head of those corporations are members of the Council on Foreign Relations. And all those people are a part, the Council on Foreign Relations is a literal extension, is a literal part, just like the Rhodes Scholarship, of this society, this actual factual society. And then you fast forward up to 2014, Obama, when he reauthorized the, tw the 2014 National Defense Authorization Act, it included a subsection allowing for domestic propaganda and spying. So we're paying with our own tax money to be spied on, and this is nothing new that's been happening well over 100 years now. So I just wanted to give you guys a little bit about this, but it's pretty... And just to prove my last point, just a brief one, um, he was, like all members of the Milner Group, a member of the Royal Institute of International Affairs. The Royal Institute of International Affairs is the sister group to the Council on Foreign Relations right here. So you have this group, Right? You have the roundtable group, and they control everything. All the information, the schools, the libraries, and not just the schools on politics and history, on everything. They put their people as charge in charge of everything. Then they come over here, and then they create the Council on Foreign Relations. And they openly talk about how they want to centralize power to a technocracy, and, and they espouse their beliefs about one world and so forth. But then you think, oh, well, you know, the Democrats and Republicans, there's going to be a big difference of them, you know, and uh, as uh, James Fletcher was commenting, talking about how Bush was working, you know, uh, Prescott Bush was working with the Nazis, his bank, Union Banking Corporation, was seized by J. Edgar Hoover for trading with the enemies, just like Rockefeller, just like all these other people, but it's not just the Republicans, it's the Democrats too, and just to make that point extremely clear, Almost every single president, Democrat or Republican, has been a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Remember, this is a, 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 a racist, elitist group created by a secret society that openly brags what they want to do and, and says what they're all about. On record, you guys can get the books. There, you can, and if you, if you can't wait to go download them, you just go to Google Books or Apple Books and just download them, pay a couple bucks. Some of them are free. So you got the Democrats and Republicans, all of them are members of the Council on Foreign Relations. Gina Raimondo is also not only a Rhodes Scholar, but she's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations as well. So almost every head of the World Bank, the IMF, it's, a, it's like George Carlin said. It's a big club, and we ain't in it. And the thing is, this big club thinks that you're a piece of crap, and that you're weak, and that you won't do anything about it. Well... I'm not a piece of crap, and I'm going to do something about it. So, and that thing is going to be peaceful. So, the first thing that we need to do is spread the word about this. And, you know, I get a lot of guff for being, hey, well, whatever, I don't like the way you talk. Or, hey, well, you sound like this, sound like that. Well, great. Everything that I read to you was a quote out of a book, which is all facts, and it really goes against the grain of all the repeaters. So people have been repeating this propaganda that they've gotten from the Rhodes Group, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Royal Institute for International Affairs, and they take it as truth. They li I actually challenge somebody to find one aspect of our lives which has not been influenced by this group of people in one shape or another. I challenge somebody. I will buy somebody five tacos from the place of their choosing, if you can find one aspect of our life that has not been influenced by the Council on Foreign Relations, the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, or any of these elite families, or their intertwined corporations or tax-exempt foundations. So, anyways, I'm going to sign off, but those are just a few quotes. I mean, I didn't even get into the page 60. Can you just imagine what that book is like? That book is like confirms everything, and so is Tragedy and Hope. 
So I'm going to sign off, but yet again, more facts proving what I'm talking about and proving that the one thing that we have to do to start being successful is to let other people know about this and share the word because people can't work on a problem unless they know they have it. People are good people and people do care. Most liberals and most conservatives are well-meaning people and they want to help. They're just like all humans. You know, we fight and bicker. But uh, at the end of the day, if there's a hurricane or if there's a flooding, it doesn't make a difference if that person's Democrat or Republican. People get in the water and they want to help. And when shit goes down in Haiti, people send tons of money. Most people are good people. And, but they've been lied to. And they've been lied to by repeaters. And the elites have lied to them and put, put a facade over society. They're, they're the societal engineers. They think that we're too stupid, and they openly say it. People like Edward Bernays and all these other people in their writings. They think that we're too stupid to run our own lives and make our own decisions. So that, like sheep, we have to be manipulated and brainwashed and told what to do. Now, I'm paraphrasing, but these pe a number of people have said this on record. The people that control lives. And there is a thing called societal engineering. It's happening a long time. So we need to get out of the realm of the repeaters and start questioning and use the Socratic method to question. So check out that David Icke video about repeaters. Like I said, I don't believe everything that David Icke says, but I think this right here is a really brilliant piece. Uh, David Icke repeaters. And then send some emails to, uh, to the people down here, the state reps down here in Rhode Island. I should have an update for you guys tomorrow with one of my videos on that. And I've gotten a bunch of emails already and I'm going to follow up. I do have Two more phone calls to follow with tomorrow, so I think after that I can at least give you guys an update. Nonetheless, thanks for bearing with me. Godspeed, Spider-Man.